Moms in the Zone. All things sports, all things from a mom perspective. Welcome to Moms in the Zone. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Moms in the Zone. Today, our guest is Mr. Brent Calloway. He's the Performance Director, Pro Sports of Exos. Welcome to Moms in the Zone, Mr. Calloway. How are you? I'm good, y'all. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me. Really excited about it. Yes, this. thank you for being with us today. We're going to get right to it because we're so excited to have you on as our guest today. And so the first question out of the gate is, tell our viewers a little bit about you and your background. Yep. Yep. You got it. So uh, I'm a strength conditioning coach uh, and I work for our private entity, which is called Exos. Uh, Exos is uh, is the global leader in human performance. So we have a a very large company. It's not... uh, you know, I've spent many years, about, about 18 years at this point in the human performance industry, sports performance industry. Um, that's typically, if it's not, you know, collegiate or professional sports, then it's a private entity that's usually small in nature. So you have some mom and pop shops and, and things of that sort. And Exos is the opposite of that. You know, we're a, we're a, uh, a global corporate wellness company uh, that started off as a, um, as a performance company, we have all of our roots in human performance and sports performance. Um, our company was founded in 1999. And uh, in, with that being the case, we've always been true to the athletes. Um, and human performance, for those, if I'm, if I'm speaking a term that most people haven't heard, uh, human performance is going to involve not just strength and conditioning, but also physical therapy, mindset practices, um, nutrition services would also be in there so it's it's the uh the the whole spectrum of of the the human body in all of its development Um, but exos has four facilities that are professional athletes facing we have uh, one in carlsbad california which is a suburb of san diego we have one in frisco texas which is a suburb of dallas we have one in uh in gulf breeze uh florida which is at the andrews institute right outside of pensacola uh, and then our home base uh, is in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so in, that's where we handle all off-season training for professional athletes. We do athlete rehab there. Um, we have uh, a huge NFL combine prep program, which I think is what we're going to get into today a good bit. But we work with, uh, with all spectrums of, uh, of, of bodies, truly. Uh, from I mentioned corporate wellness, we also have a, a tactical wellness side. So we work with the United States military and, and other countries' military services. Um, and then we have uh, also an employer side, like a hospital side. So we have facilities at the Mayo Clinic and other Andrews Institute facilities as well. So there's really a lot of things that are inside of there. And that was the uh, that was the Exos um, description, if you will. And my job inside of that is to make sure that all of our professional athlete facing programs are accomplishing the tasks that they need to. Uh, so, you know, if, if we're preparing an athlete for the NFL combine, um, then my job is to make sure that myself and our staff have really combed over uh, all aspects of everything that that athlete is going to be tested on. Uh, mm-hmm. And then we've covered all of our bases for that athlete to be fully prepared. Then it would be the same thing if that's a, an off season program for major league baseball or the NBA um, that could be, um, you know, working with individual sport athletes like professional tennis, uh, track and field. Um, so there's, there's uh, quite an extensive piece to that. We also service teams as well. So occasionally we will have professional teams both in the U.S. and, uh, and globally who will reach out to us and, and maybe their general manager wants to bring in a performance system uh, rather than piecemealing it and hiring a strength coach from this other institute or team. Um, and then you have a physical therapist who comes with a different mindset and a dietitian, and everybody's trying to work together. Well, if you bring in Exos, we can just drop that team in and they all speak the same language uh, from a performance standpoint. So we all function very well together. Um, so it's, it's kind of like dropping in that, that, uh, that system in its entirety from the very beginning, rather than having to try to get those people to integrate well. Um, so there's a lot of facets of it. I jumped around right there a little bit, but I hope you guys followed me on it. Now it's a one-stop shop. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. there you go. There you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Exactly. It's, my question would be, you mentioned on a piece of, about the combine, and mm-hmm. I know that I don't know a whole lot about the process. So I guess my interest is, like, if you have an athlete who is coming off of an injury, their post-injury, 
what are some right. of the things that you do to have them prepare for the combine? You know, um, mm -hmm. they themselves feel like they're 100 percent, 110 percent healed. But what is the extra steps that Exos would take for that, you know, particular player, you know, coming off of that injury, but, you know, wanting to be a part of the combine? Right, right. So um, you, you have two processes that are inside of there, two things that you would be preparing for. So number one is for the evaluation period at the combine. Um, mm -hmm. So that's going to be, you know, roughly 380 athletes get invited to that, right? And, and they're okay. going to comb through the full diagnostics. They'll, they're going to have the athletes go to, uh, to a hospital and they're going to get MRI'd and checked at a hospital for all of their former injuries, x-rayed, all those things will be done. Um, they also have screenings like joint by joint screenings. Imagine oh, you're, wow. you, you know, you're going to a job interview. Think about this mm -hmm. for a second. You, you'd be going to a job interview fresh out of college. And the first thing that they do, you walk into a room and they put you on a table and they start tugging on your shoulder over here and over <laughs> here and down here. And, and then, you know, they ask you a couple of questions about, uh, do you have pain here or there? And then you move to the next table and they start working on your back this way and that way and asking you the same thing, then your hip, then your knee, then your ankles. Wow. Um, and that's just to see if you're going to, if you're going to even check the box to qualify for the job, you know? Um, so the, all of those pieces are, are put in there. They basically are, you know, if they're, if they're going to be offering somebody a, a, a job for, you know, $500,000 minimum salary, they want to make sure that, that everybody, that all things are, are known about each one of those athletes, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they're trying to mitigate their risk as much as they can too. There's um, their interview processes with that. There's obviously the physical testing part, which is on the TV, uh, but there are those three days of like medical checks and interviews um, that are, are usually not covered in the media. And we have to prepare athletes for that too. Um, I'm gonna get back to your question in just a second. I didn't lose it. Uh, and the other part of that is that every university has a pro day process as well so right. you can you can kind of think of of the pro day as an individual combine it's just like all the scouts are going to come to one campus they evaluate everybody and then they leave the next day and go to the next campus so um, if athletes don't get invited to the combine then they have their uh, their evaluation period at their pro day at their university which there's benefits and detriments to both to be honest with you um, so when it comes to an injured athlete uh what we do is to have physical therapists, not just athletic trainers, uh, but we have licensed and degreed physical therapists on our staff who work hand in hand with the performance coaches, the strength and, and speed coaches, um, mm -hmm. to make sure that the athlete goes, uh, let's say they, they walk in. This is a yearly thing for us. So we'll have athletes who are injured in a bowl game. Uh, sometimes they're coming in right after surgery and, and they're going to spend um, a few weeks where they're, they're, uh, I, I will say they're dedicated most of their time to the physical therapist to get them up and mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be a, a critical element right there. Uh, our dietitians are working with them to help them get their body comp in proper order, get new nutrients into their body uh, that are of a healing nature so that, you know, we'll have them on uh, our supplements. So they'll be taking multivitamins. They'll be on fish oils to help reduce inflammation and, and promote healing. Uh, there will be other um, uh, other supplements that will be added in for them on that, and and uh, we will we're we're constantly trying to to educate all collegiate athletes that are making this transition on what good nutrition is, mm -hmm. you know, and and that's a that's something that that they've usually had in some small elements at the university level, um, but they've been that like they've been prepared that food and given that food and you just got to go to the cafeteria and get it and and now they're transitioning to a new block in life where they're gonna have to do that for themselves so we try to give them education on that too um but back to the the injury rehab question uh if if a pt is spending a lot of time with the athlete the dietitian is getting all the nutrients into the body that they need uh then we have what we call like a blending period we call it our integration phase where mm -hmm. the performance coach and the physical therapist are working hand in hand so that there can be a handoff to the performance coach uh, okay. once that, that athlete has uh, gone out to, you know, if it's a knee injury, they become weight bearing, or if it's a shoulder injury, uh, how much uh, sprint or change direction or agility training can they do if, you know, if they have a shoulder injury. But we work hand in hand uh, as an entity so that as we get to uh, – the, the evaluation period, be that at the combine or the pro day, 
that that athlete has had all of the exposure to all the tests and all of the movements uh, and the sprinting and things of that sort that they're going to need, that all happens in that integration period. So to, to make what I provided as a, a very long-winded answer, and you guys feel free to like chop me at any time because I'm a talker and sometimes I just, I get going. But, um, uh, you know, to make that short, the, the more that you can have a, a physical therapist licensed and degreed physical therapist responsible for the athlete and then hand that over in a very clean way to a certified strength conditioning coach, then the better that process is going to be handled. Um, and, and that's, it, it sounds very simple, but it's actually not. Um, and lots of, uh, professional teams have problems with that. There's lots of universities that have problems with that. You know, it's, uh, sometimes university strength and conditioning departments and their athletic training departments, they don't see eye to eye, you know, they kind of function in their own two areas. So right. the athletic training department is going to be on one side of the building and the strength and conditioning staff is on another side of the building and the strength staff just wants access to the athletes and the athletic trainers don't want the strength staff to have them because they don't want them to hurt them. Um, so, you know, what we do is kind of bring that down into one tight, small family uh, so that we can solve those problems ourselves and then communicate very effectively on each athlete. I did have a follow-up question. Um, Brent, I, I think you had made a comment saying that there's benefits and um, also a detriment to having um, the mm. pro day at the school as opposed mm -hmm. to doing it. What are you, why, why would you say that? What are your comments? Yeah, about? That, that's a great question. Um, so not all athletes are going to get invited to the combine, right? I mean, we know that. So what the combine provides is um, that's going to be the most inclusive testing process that anybody can go through, right? So if they're, if they're going to be checked out, then that's the process to go through. Now, a, a downside to being at the combine are the stress levels that go with it. You're going to be in a new city. You're going to be staying in a hotel. Uh, sometimes you have a roommate that you don't know inside that hotel. It's a four-day interview process. So, you know, you're, you may be walking through the hotel to go grab some lunch and you may have an offensive coordinator, or defensive coordinator, just grab you and say, Hey, I need to get 15 minutes with you real quick and then sit down and they start, you know, drilling you on blocking assignments or pass rush schemes or, you know, whatever the case is, or ask you about a time you might've gotten in trouble or, you know, whatever happens there. So because of that, and because they keep your days really full, um, you have now three days where that happens. So you can imagine how on edge a lot of 21, 22 year old athletes are with all of that going on on a regular basis. Plus you're in a new city, plus you're in a hotel. And now on day four, now they're going to do everything physical and they're going to put a camera on your face and have you do all this testing that, uh, that you, you've never done before, you know? And, and so you got Deion Sanders is going to be talking about, you know, all those things. Now you're going to get all of that uh, done at the combine, right? So, that, that's a benefit. Everybody's there. Everybody's going to see you. So you may not make an impression on some people. You may make an impression on others. Now, at the pro day, there's benefits because you're sleeping in a bed that you're really comfortable in. It's one day. Uh, all of that interview process is less extensive. So they're not going to be, uh, you know, there will be a lot more Zoom calls than there would be face-to-face -face interviews. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's not going to be near as nerve-wracking. Um, you're, you're waking up, you're eating your own food. Everything is a lot more predictable. You're at your university. You know what the field is like. You're comfortable with the facilities. Uh, and so those people come to see you. Now, the detriment to that is that everybody's not there, right? So I don't have all of the owners in the building. I don't have all of the GMs in the building. Sometimes some scouts will actually collect information for other team scouts. Uh, so sometimes they work in, in conjunction like that. And, and you know, that, that's different for every school. Um, at, uh, you know, at, at the bigger schools, at the P5 level with a lot of prospects, you're going to have more people there. Now, if, if you play at a smaller school, um, let, I'm, a, I'm a, a North Carolina grad, but let, say I played at, at North Carolina A&T, there might only be, you know, three people that come to a pro day that I'm involved in. And so now what could have been viewed at, you know, by hundreds of people, thousands of people is now kind of bucketed down to a smaller group. So. I'm glad you mentioned that because my son goes to Florida A&M. So I'm, I'm glad does he? You, yes, he does. So I'm glad you, you yeah. put that in there about an HBCU because it gives some perspective from an HBCU versus a power five, like you said. So mm -hmm. it, it, Yeah, it definitely does. And, you know, you can throw all the mid-majors in there as well. You know, in Texas, we have 
so many Division One universities, um, and and they just can't. You know, everybody can't make every pro day. It just right. it's not feasible to do that. There's too many to to get across. So yeah, there's um there, there's definitely you, you want to take advantage of every opportunity that you get, and you want to capitalize on it. And so you know the 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 thing that we always preach is uh, just control what you can control as an athlete and be prepared when it's your time to go and focus on what you can do. Um, and that's all you can ask for. So I, I had a follow up question, but my first question was, be, how do you even get to you? I mean, what if you're an athlete, you want to prepare, do, do they just call you directly? Do they have to have a referral? How does that work? Yeah, no one has to have a referral. So everyone can contact us directly. Um, we have a, I have a, a uh, a colleague who handles all of our business development. Uh, I mentioned that we have four facilities in those four locations. So if somebody wants to train, uh, we're, we're really easy uh, to find on social media. So we have a, a, a handle that is XO Sports. Um, I'm also on social media at just at Brent Calloway. So we're, we're pretty easy to find that way. We get a lot of, uh, of people reach out to us directly. Once an athlete has decided that they're going to be uh, move into the professional level, then all of that is set up through an agent. Um, oh, so, okay. uh, you know, I, I, I'm friends with Tori Dandy, who I know you guys talked to recently, and, and I've right. worked with Tori a number of times, and, and he's a wonderful, wonderful agent. Um, and so, you know, if, if, um, if somebody was signing with Tori, you know, Tori and I are on speed dial with each other, and he's on speed dial with, uh, with my colleague who handles uh, all of the operations of getting people in. So he would just call him and say, you know, I've, I've got this young man coming in. He's going to be reporting on, you know, Monday the 4th. Uh, he's going to need a hotel. He's going to need a rental car. He's going to need food starting on Monday. Let me know, you know, what steps we need to take. And then we have everything that just drops in place after that. So it truly is a one-stop shop. You know, once, yep. once the contact is made with you all, everything from that point is just kind of, you know, it's done in-house. So you have everyone there on staff and you guys can, and I like the piece where you guys can take care of the nutrition. Uh, because like you said, a lot of these kids are coming from colleges. They've been on their own for the last three and a half, four years. Um, and, you know, the, even though they have nutritionists on campus, some of them kids are not, <laughs> they're not eating that food. So I think that's really good because the body that it takes to play, you know, I'm football, you know, because that's what mm -hmm. our sons play, but to go from the collegiate level to the professional level, that is your vessel, you know, to keep going, you know, in this sport. So you have to really, that is a good thing that you guys have everything that they need right there. That, that's very true. And, you know, we have a, a saying inside of our company um, that's actually moved outside of our company now, but you, you cannot out train bad nutrition you know oh, some so the, the first you know the first time I heard that it was uh it it, it kind of lit me up a little bit because you always think okay well I can eat this because I'm gonna I have two training sessions I'm gonna go through today I'm gonna be in the weight room for an hour I'm gonna be on the field for an hour I might have position work or a practice session inside of there too but if if you are consistently in a uh, in a bad situation nutritionally and you're not getting the nutrients that you need uh, number one, to fuel yourself, then you're not getting the nutrients that you need to heal yourself as well. And, mm. and what, we're, what we're doing when we're training athletes is we're trying to give them more horsepower, more mobility, more stability, um, you know, refine their mechanics, put those things in play at full speed. And when we do those things, we know that we're causing trauma to the body. That's, that's part of training, right? That's mm -hmm. why we wake up and we're sore. Um, and then, you know, we have to go back and, and do it again. So what we try to do is recover as hard as we train. And, mm. you know, and we explain it like that. If we're going to train hard, we have to recover hard. And part of recovering hard is not just, you know, putting on Norma Tech boots or going and sitting in a hot tub or a cold tub or going to a sauna or sleeping. Uh, but nutrition is the foundational level of that. Because if, you know, if you've got a dying plant, you've got to get it sun and water so that it can come back. And that's what we have to do with the body as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I had a question. I know we're talking specifically about NFL um, yes, prospects, but what if you're wanting to get to that level? What, what are some things like if you're in high school, what would you say to uh, uh, high school athletes that are going to college and then probably, you know, have the ability to go to the NFL? What should they be focused on? I know we said nutrition and recovery, but what are some things that you feel like 
athletes have been missing in high school that has impeded their process in college, perhaps? Yeah, so, so the, the typical high school and college process is very similar to each other, and it's different when you get to the NFL. So in high school, it's all about, you know, how strong can you make this athlete from, a, from an off-season perspective or a lifting perspective or strength mm-hmm. conditioning. Mm-hmm. It's all about uh, – um, it's about strength over the opponent – and then typically it's who is in better shape, right? So then you end up with these workouts that are like, we, we got to go run 40 40s today and things of that sort. Um, and so when that happens and when we run lots of suicides and, and when we do lots of these other exercises that are just like straight conditioning based, there's some application for that. But at the same time, um, it, th- those aren't speed exercises. They're not making anybody faster. They're not making anybody right. stronger. You're, you're getting people really good at running 65% is, is what you're teaching them, you know? So, um, so what my, what my hints would be, um, would be to find somebody in an area that can help supplement what's going on at the school, at the high school. Um, you know, you if that's a, a, a private performance coach, you know, you want to look mm-hmm. for somebody who is a certified specialist through the NSCA. That's a good one. So if, if there's moms watching, write that one down. It's the National mm-hmm. Strength and Conditioning Association. They have a, a very extensive certification process. You have to study. You have to be degreed. You have to pass a test. Um, and it's, you know, we take it very seriously. That's our, that, those are our boards that we have to study for. Um, and, and so if you can find somebody who, uh, who has that type of knowledge, Um, And then can supplement whatever the high school coach is doing because a high school coach has, you know, 70 athletes, 80 athletes on a team. And so what they're going to be doing is what we call coaching on a global scale. They're trying to give everybody kind of the shotgun approach at what they need. So if, you know, if, if, if we need to develop strength, then everybody's going to have the same program because that's all I can manage because we got so many people. Um, Mm -hmm. In a smaller scenario, you can dial that in more. So, you know, I can give, like, Nikki, I can give you exactly what you need to supplement what's going on at the school. You know, if you bring me the program or talk to me what's going on there, then I can pick up all of the other pieces. Um, and, and that's critical for, from a mobility standpoint, um, you know, one of the things that is, everybody knows the ACL tear, right? The ACL rupture right. is like, it's like, it's like the dreaded thing that's going on right now. And um, a lot of the issues with ACLs happen, uh, because of mechanical issues and joint restrictions that, that happen on field. If it's non-contact, I'll say. Um, and so with that being the case, there aren't a lot of uh, high school coaches and teachers that are educated up on how to correct that. Um, but you should be able to find that at good performance training institutes and centers that, that may be in your area. Um, I have a question because I'm always thinking long term and how people can work together do you guys ever do like training seminars for like high school coaches because my thought is if everyone's working together you're producing a better athlete ultimately Mm -hmm. you know what I mean and you're just kind of Mm -hmm. going as a team you know you know um producing that yes yes ma'am exactly so we have done that before in the past very medium reception to, Um, to to high school coaches um, I think most of the times with high school coaches, they want to spend their continuing education time learning offense and defense and, and the nuances of the game, because that's what interests them. And that's probably the, the, uh, that's what's going to move them forward in their career more. Cause there aren't a whole lot of high school strength conditioning coaches. You know, normally you've got like, like it's the D line coach or the O line coach that ends up being responsible for the strength conditioning program. Uh, but he's not a specialist inside of that. Uh, what we're actually releasing in January, which is, is going to be stellar, is an online subscription model uh, platform where we're releasing education to strength and conditioning uh, coaches and, and people inside the field. It, that's, it's going to be positioned to strength and conditioning coaches in sport, but it'll trickle down to you know, personal trainers or um, you know, parents who are recreational athletes who also, you know, may have a, a weight room in a garage or something like that and working with their kids in there. Um, mm-hmm. So that's, uh, that's going to come in January from us. And that's going to, that's our platform to help deliver the education process that will be receivable to anybody anywhere. 
Okay. And you actually answered a couple of questions because I do know um, sometimes parents are asking, you know, each of us, you know, do, should we send our child to training? But you were just saying some supplement mm -hmm. to what they're getting at the high school is beneficial. So I think that's that's really good. It answers a lot of parents' questions. So definitely, yeah. definitely. I, it just all of those small pieces. And, you know, you think about um, if, if we think about drawing like a comparison to school or something like that, you know, you you getting your kids to school is one thing, but making sure that they're understanding every single class that they have and they're getting their work right. done and all that, that's, that's what fills in the gaps, you know? And so that's what, that's what we want to do as well. So we want to make sure that the strength and conditioning process is getting handled at school is going to be what it is. And then we want to fill in all of those small gaps for the athlete. And then I, I don't want to monopolize, but I have a question. <laughs> Say you're working with an athlete, um, preparing them, and then you see something. Do you report that to the agent that sent them? You know, maybe they had like a tear or stuff. You're like, hey, Tori, I didn't know this, but, you know, the guy came in, he's kind of banged up. So how does that work? There's lots of communication on that front. Okay. Um, and so now if you, if you think about it, so we've talked about kind of the 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 professional evaluation mm -hmm. side that the teams will be doing uh, we're trying to uncover all the information that we can on the athlete too because that's information that helps guide the process for us mm -hmm. uh, you know so if one of your sons or daughters is training with us we want to try to uncover every bit of physical information from them that we can because that helps guide the exercise prescription and and the process uh for you know how we move them forward um, if something happens during that process, we absolutely have to loop in as many people as we can, right? So typically, mm -hmm. parents are going to get looped in, you know, by the kid, so if, if by the athlete. Um, an agent wants to hear it from us because they want the medical breakdown, and then we're also happy to reach out to, if, if you know, if we have moms and dads that are involved in the process, we reach out to them too. Um, but yeah, there, there are some times when we uncover some things that an athlete didn't know about. Um, sometimes it's not big, you know, it could be small. We might be talking about, I actually had an athlete check in, an SEC athlete check in on Monday of this week, and he had had a, a scope on, um, uh, on a, an ankle. And because of that, he had an asymmetry in the amount of flexion that one ankle got versus the other. So mm. one ankle moves a lot more than the other ankle moves. Well, if that's the case, whenever he's running, uh, he's going to have compensations up his body. So that can go to a knee, that can go to a hip, that can go to low back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with those things, we're going to be chasing that. And we're going to be treating that and trying to solve that problem as quickly as we can so that, number one, we can keep him as safe as possible. And then number two, we can give him more power because if you are lacking ankle mobility, then you can't use the big muscle groups that you need to to produce force. So you may mm -hmm. be strong enough to uh to do that but you might not be able to access that power um actually a, a great example of that was devin white the linebacker from lsu who's you know he's, he's doing great things and in, in uh in the nfl right now in his second year devin came in also with uh with some really tight ankles and he was strong as an ox i mean this guy was he's like the perfect athlete he was just really tight in his lower body but because he was really tight uh when he came in he was a little bit heavy, uh, number one, because it just got off the holidays. So you can imagine uh, he's a little bit heavy after eating uh, with the family for a bit. And he came in and we ran a 40. He ran a, I think he ran a 465, right, when he checked in, right, which is not bad at all, especially for right. a 250-pound linebacker. Yeah. All right. So, so what we did was we took him from 250 to 235, and then we got mm. his ankles moving. And then once we got mm -hmm. his ankles moving, then he could use – you know, he was a, a really strong lower body kid with his back squat was really good. His deadlift was really good. So then he could access all of those muscles. So we went from 250 and a 465 down to uh, 235 and a 442 at the combine. And he was, the fastest, he was the fastest linebacker at the combine. And when they saw that, they were like, well, we'll take this kid fifth overall, you know? And so, right. Absolutely. That, that changes the game a little bit. And, and it also helps, you know, with, your ankle mobility uh, is going to be a big thing if, with change of direction and being able to drop your center of mass and get in and out mm. of breaks. So, 
you know, all the different positions have different things like that, but that's what those coaches are evaluating whenever they're putting athletes through drills. Like how well does he bend? Where does he bend? Does he bend at the knees? Does he bend at the hips? Does he bend at the low back? Um, and they're trying to figure out, um, you know, what that movement's going to come out like when it's on field and, and uh, if the athlete is going to be okay or not. So. I think I got off on a tangent right there, but did That's I answer okay. your No, it was good. No, you, you, that was good stuff. That was good to okay. know. I have a quick question. When we're talking yes, about um, human performance and you're talking mm -hmm. about nutrition and recovery and um, all the elements that go with that, um, is there also the element of mental and emotional uh, piece of it as well? And if so, what part does EXOS play in that? In yeah. Yeah. There absolutely is, and, and that's the hardest piece, right? Yeah. But, you know, mm -hmm. what goes on uh, inside is the hardest piece. Uh, we feel like from a coaching standpoint, one of the areas where we can, uh, we can provide the most benefit is by ensuring that athletes are prepared. Yeah. You know, if, yeah, if, right. if you've studied sufficiently and you know exactly what's going to be on this test, and then you show up and the test is exactly what you thought it was going to be, you're much more confident in that scenario. Um, and if there are athletes who we find out that they may be challenged in one area, let's say they made some bad decisions in high school or college, so they know they're going to get questions on this. We want we want them to uh, to understand what that's going to be like as well, you know. So we will we will definitely put the athletes through those paces of answering those questions, mm -hmm. and uh, even to the point where you know we brought in PR specialists before to help them form their answers and um, you know be consistent with their answers. So if I'm telling one person from one team one thing, I want to make sure I'm telling another person from another team the same thing. And if I made mm -hmm. a bad decision, I'm I'm regretful in that that I made that decision and I've grown as a human, et cetera. Um, so yeah, we, we want to, to cover that process too. And then in addition to that, it's, you know, it's some of the small things like we talked about earlier, controlling what you can control. You know, I, 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 I can't change what you think of me. I can only do the best that I can do, you That's know? Right. And so you're going to, you're going to have to form your own opinion and I just want to make the best impression that I can. So that's part of it too. I mean, we bring in a former general manager uh, to talk to the athletes. And, and so he'll do his own research as well. And so he comes in and if there was uh, somebody who has some speed bumps in the road, then he'll, he'll talk to them about that and ask them questions and say, you know, here's what, uh, here's how I would want to hear that question answered if I was going to push somebody on that. Um, other things like the Wonderlick test, you know, that's another thing that pops up during uh, the evaluation period, either at the pro day or, or at the combine. And we want to make sure athletes are comfortable being in a, a quiet room, taking a 12 minute test. Um, so yeah, our coaches uh, in our facilities coach with a lot of positivity. Uh, we do hold people accountable, uh, but it's, it's not, um, it, it's, it's not a boot camp. Um, you know, there's, there's nobody that's going to, uh, to, to chase you down and, and scream at you. We're going to treat people like a professional, but at the same time, we have everybody knows what that schedule is and, and inside of our process for, you know, training for the combine, that's a, that's a 40 hour per week, you know, work job. Mm -hmm. I, I just said work job, which is not, you know, a very way, a good way to put it, but it's a 40 hour per week job where you're going to work every day, you know, you're coming in the building at eight o'clock and you're yeah. eating your breakfast and you're going to your training session and you have physical therapy and you're going to meet with a position coach. Then you got a lift and uh, you have to do your recovery pieces. So, you know, you're in the building all day. Um, and so we're going to hold athletes accountable to that too. And, and um, I think that's important because they need to know that, that they need to be ready. So, you know, from a, from a mental piece, the big things for us are preparedness, positivity, and, uh, and, and holding the athletes accountable so that, uh, that they know where they're supposed to be and, and providing an organized structure for them that, uh, that is very predictable. That's another good piece of it too, so. And so that leads me to a question then. How would you, you know, what would advice would you give to an athlete to prepare? Like, what do they need to do so that they come to the combined prepared? I mean, mm -hmm. what does that look like? Yeah. Uh, you, you have to surround yourself with good people that you trust. Like mm -hmm. I would tell you that is, that's paramount. Um, and I always enjoy um, when, you know, there's a lot of times when I talk to athletes 
there's a lot of times when I talk to athletes, parents too, and family members, um, aunts and uncles and, and everybody else that's involved in that situation. And that helps me to feel like the athlete is making the right decision because now they're, they're investing in others' opinions to help ask some questions. So I'm on the phone with, with some moms on occasion. And, and I love that, 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 you know, that they care that much and they want to ask those questions and make sure that, that their son or their daughter, whichever part of the process is there, is, is being taken care of. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so, you know, with that being the case, I would absolutely say that um, families need to make that decision collectively and do their homework and, and find out who has the most experience. Um, I, I think a lot of the times now, especially with social media, as popular as it is, sometimes athletes will go toward, you know, what's cool or what's sexy and, you know, what's popping and what's getting the most likes and all that other stuff. Right. And, and that's not always what is showing the experience level and the decision making and all the pieces of the puzzle that go to that. Because a lot of the people who are, are kind of devoted to that process aren't doing big things on social media. They're doing that other process. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, so because of that, I, I think that, uh, Families, parents, athletes should always ask questions about experience levels, results, um, statistics. Like, you know, if, if, um, if you've been doing a job for 15, 10 or 15 years, you're going to have statistics on how you can change something for somebody. Right. And anybody in this process should be able to, to prove that as well. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it, it shouldn't just be, you know, somebody who, uh, who has uh, the, you know, the, the most followers or something of that sort, but somebody who can be trusted in that process to communicate and make good decisions and be in the best interest of, uh, of, of uh, the athlete. Absolutely. Brent, do you guys take anyone? Cause the first thing that comes to mind, there's a lot of people out there that think they're an elite athlete and they're really not. Would you take them and just put them in a separate, <laughs> I'll say a separate work group or something? Yeah, Nikki, I got you. Um, Anybody can train at our facilities. Okay. Anybody can train at our facilities. Um, we don't do it very much, but um, actually I, I saw a second grader training at our facility the other day in a one-on-one situation who's, whose parents were, you know, just trying to give him the, the, the best option possible. Um, dad was a professional football player, but, uh, you know, they, they just wanted him to, to be able to find a place now with like COVID restrictions and things. I don't know if he's home. Uh, at, with school or not, but where he can exercise, where he can train. So he had a, uh, you know, a trainer that was taking him through stuff. And it's one of our trainers who takes pro athletes through things. Um, mm-hmm. So anybody can train with us. All of our facilities have um, what we call our rally groups, which would be, uh, you know, any uh, mom, dad, employee, whatever, uh, will be inside that group if they're non-athletes. Uh, and then we have high school groups, we have middle school groups. So collegiate group so anybody can come in and train and, and I have a question too because I, I look at a lot of the um, collegiate you know you look at the big programs and they have these great um, strength and conditioning they have the physical therapy the, th- the trainers the nutrition they have all of that so if a kid comes from a program that doesn't have all of that are, they're already coming in at a disadvantage how can they even I don't even know if the word catch up is even, even the thing, but if I'm coming from a program that doesn't have all of the bells and whistles that I'm, you know, Alabama or a Notre Dame or USC, all of these big names, how, how do I even prepare if I'm already coming from a disadvantage of not having those resources available at my university? No, that's a, that's a really, really good question. Um, what I would tell you is that from a collegiate standpoint, I would say that all collegiate programs are checking the boxes on strength development. Now, they might not have the, you know, the, the $4 million weight room. They may have the, 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 the $10,000 weight room. But at the same time, the movement patterns that you're loading are the same. Everybody's going to squat. Everybody's gonna, going to bench press. Everybody's going to be doing pull-ups. And, and so um, – if, if we're solving the problem 85% of the way, weight rooms, uh, weight rooms are, are nice weight rooms, are, are big time investments in the recruiting aspect, right? That's, mm-hmm. that's what's going to be a, a, a big uh, appeal there. And then the other part of having great professionals is, you know, what we call player availability. So the, 
the the better professionals you have, you would hope the the more that your that the player will be uh, prepared for in game scenarios and not injured. Okay, right. so but uh, with that being the case, and, and I think every university is has um, adequate professionals to prepare from a strength standpoint and conditioning standpoint. That's just it's the smaller pieces. So I've had athletes from. Uh, you know, from West Texas a and M. I've had athletes from, from, you know, lots of other small schools that come in and it's new to them. There are a lot of new things, but if, if they're an athlete that's played four years of, uh, of collegiate football, then most of the time they have adequate levels of strength to do the job. It's just a matter of, of refining those pieces. And, and that's what we're okay. here for is, is to help them carry that over to uh, to a, a level that's starting to transition them into the NFL and, and teach them how to do that for themselves. Um, you know, we we have um, lots of exercises that athletes can do at home that aren't uh, that aren't dependent on you know how much weight you have over here that you're picking up or this machine that you could use over here. Um, it's really developing the athlete is about learning how to prepare your own body and you don't have to have a lot of tools for that mm -hmm. um, actually funny story so with the with uh, all of the COVID stuff that popped up this year mm -hmm. you know one of the things that that we wanted to do with the NFL to we actually have a relationship with the NFL Players Association so okay. um, we're, the, we're the only performance institute who um, uh, we have a, a, a financial arrangement with the, the Players Association where every every players dues that goes to the PA actually there is a trust that's established that goes toward player wellness and so some of that is for retired players and some of it is for released players um, so if there's ever an athlete who is you know played on a team for three years and then gets released they can come to our facilities and train for free basically covered by uh, the dues of the of the players association so when uh, when COVID hit and all the facilities shut down, you know, it, it, we saw this happen. We knew that the writing on the wall was going to be once they open back up and the season starts again, players haven't had enough time right. to prepare. You're going to see this rash of injuries. Um, and so what we wanted to do is talk to the Players Association and be able to deliver programming for, uh, for players that they could do from home. Mm. Um, so, we have a, uh, a web-based platform that we use where we can send out uh, prescribed strength conditioning sessions. So, you know, you'll see that you have, uh, you know, squat on here uh, prescribed for you. You can log in your weight. It shows you a video of how, you know, we want you to do the squat and it says your sets and reps, and then it moves on to the next thing. So what we did was as, as soon as, as the NFL locked down their weight rooms, um, we opened that up and we said, you know, if, if you need a program, fill out the survey and send it to us. And the only real big questions that we had on that survey, other than name and email address, uh, was position that you played and then the strength and conditioning equipment that you had available at home. And so we then uh, wrote a, uh, a sprinting progression and multi-directional progression that you could do in the yard or at a school or in a park. Um, and that was based on the position that the athlete played. And then we ask you if you had no equipment at home, you were in an apartment, then we wrote a, a body weight based exercise prescription that checked all of the boxes, just like we would if, if we were an NFL team. Um, if you had some equipment, then we, you know, and, and maybe that's just some dumbbells and some resistance bands, then we wrote a program for that. And if you had a full weight room built out in your garage, we built a program for that. And so then the, uh, the athletes just started responding to all of those uh, those messages and then we could just um, go from seeing that response to prescribing that and sending it straight to their phone um, and my whole point for telling you that story is to let you know that uh, I feel like the athletes who had no equipment and were in an apartment so long as they were following a prescription they were prepared against injury now they might not have been able to, to pick up the type of weight that other athletes were but they were following a prescription that was going to help them stay safe when it was time to go back to work and i'm glad you mentioned that because i was going to ask how did you guys adjust doing COVID? so mm -hmm. you just answered mm -hmm. that question so yeah yeah <laughs> I can it really oh sorry go ahead brent 
That's okay. I was just gonna say really trying times right now, right for everybody. And and, right. and when your when your business is about usually having a lot of people in a small space all working hard and breathing and loud and music and everything else, <laughs> some of that right. has to change a little bit. So the dynamic of coaching with a mask on and training with a mask on, uh, all, all that is very different. But you know, our number one goal is to try and keep everybody as safe as possible. Um, so yeah, we're we're trying to do that just like everybody else is. I can definitely tell that. we're going to have to have a part two to this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I did want to allow um, Brent to enter the zone. So Brent, yes. uh, entering the zone is a segment in our interview. It just allows you to leave some lasting words, um, some quick takeaways from a mom or anyone that's looking at this. So Brent, you are now entering the zone. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I love, first off, I love being in the zone. That's, that's the best part. Of it. Um, yeah. Number one, Number one, uh, you can't out-train bad nutrition, right? So I yeah. write that down, talk to your kids about that it. Down. Yes, yes. And, and you know, make that a, a, a part of life, you know? And, and yeah. that's for all of us, too. That, that's for, for each, of, each of us. Uh, that's going to be a big thing, controlling what you can control. I've said that a few times. Uh, gosh, it, 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 thinking about you know, what we all have going on in our lives right now, we can't control everything. So all we can do is handle us and handle our business and choose how we want to respond inside of those scenarios. Uh, so, you know, and sometimes we want to get stirred up by, you know, an article we see or what happens in the news. Um, if we control ourselves, I think we'll all be a, a little bit happier uh, mm -hmm. inside of that. And, and then, uh, you know, when I get off my altruism soapbox right here and and just start to, to think about what we've already talked about. If, uh, if your, your son or daughter is an athlete and they are doing things at school in an off-season program, I would absolutely recommend in trying to find somebody that's local, that is degreed, that is certified, that can, uh, that can help fill in the blanks for them. Because that's just going to that's gonna give them, um, you know, a, a leg up as far as safety. Um, mm -hmm. from resistance to injury, all of those things are, are really paramount for us. And at the same time, we also want kids and especially high school kids to have a life too. We understand that it's not all just about, uh, just about training. So they got to have a life too. So some strategic blocks inside of, uh, where athletes are training and, and if they're getting personalized, uh, coaching specific to a position or a sport, and then they're also doing some strength and conditioning. Um, do we also have some times built in there for vacations and some times to relax and take some off weeks and kind of offload the, the mental aspect of it so that they still enjoy right. what they're doing? That's a big part of it, too. That's awesome. <laughs> well, Brent, we just want to thank you for tuning in with us today. We thank you for just dropping those jewels of um, knowledge and giving us some some key information, especially especially the mantra, you can't out-train bad nutrition. So everybody out there, right. <laughs> you can't out-train bad nutrition, and you can only control what you can control. <laughs> That's right, Shalana. Well, thank, yeah, thank you guys for having me so much. This was really fun. So yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have to do it again anytime. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you again, Mr. Callaway, for being on this episode of Moms in the Zone. Our viewers, we thank you for tuning in today, and we'll catch you in the zone. We'll see you later. Thank you.